Hello, good afternoon. This is Taib at Taibs.com. And uh, today we're going to embark on a new journey. Uh, I guess last week we finished with the second book of John. And I was going to go through third John, but I decided to shift my uh, attention a little bit. And now, uh, when I actually finished the book of first John, I wanted to uh, do the book of Exodus. Because I started that like uh, several, several months ago. But then I, I went to chapter 3 and I ran into some difficulties in interpretation. So I just wanted to pause for a second and then give my attention to the book of uh, Hebrews. I believe uh, the book of Hebrews is a hard book. It's not easy, but I think it's well worth it because there's so much stuff there that we need to know as believers and I want to turn my attention to that book. So I don't know how long this journey is going to last, but I'm not concerned with the length. You know, I want to actually learn. So my desire is to be transformed by the words of God in this book. I'm not just going to, I don't want to just fill my head with knowledge, okay? I want to be transformed by what I read. So this is why I want to read on the book of uh, Hebrews. I know it's probably going to take us maybe a year to go through it all. But you know what? It's not about how quick we can go through a book. It's about how much the book has transformed us. And that's what I want, really. You know, and uh, in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, the author actually primarily primarily writes to the Jews, okay? And Christ's identity has been the subject of a lot of scrutiny, okay? It's not only in our era, but even among his own contemporaries, they always kind of scrutinize his identity. And he was killed because he claimed to be the son of God. In John 8, 58, Jesus made a bold statement. He said, before Abraham was, I am making himself equal to God. So today we're going to start with uh, verses 1 and 3 of the book of Hebrew. And in those two, three verses alone, the author is going to authenticate the identity of Christ. And he proves that Christ is superior to the prophets of old. So we're going to dive into that today, and that's what I want to start with. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 3. Now, the scripture says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now I'm going to stop here and then we're going to dissect uh, these verses. We're going to learn what uh, we are being told. Now, verse 1, the scripture says, Again, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to us and to our fathers by the prophet. So the author is referring to the fathers, the men, the men of old. Okay, so the prophets of old were the mouthpieces of God to the people of God. So God used the prophet as his uh, uh, mouthpiece to the people. They spoke on behalf of God. But what they gave was an incomplete message. And those prophets were of great importance because they all spoke of the coming of the anointed one, the Messiah. That's what their main purpose was to speak to the people about the coming Messiah. They also gave a lot of warnings. So the prophets of old were of great importance. They were respected. They were really held in the highest honor and esteem. But the spirit of Christ in them gave the people a picture of the plan of God that was going to be accomplished by Jesus. Now the prophet, like I said, they were held in the highest esteem by the Jews. And rightfully so. Because if you go to 1 Peter 1 verse 10 to 12, you're going to read something important about the prophet. Let's read this. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 1 verse 10 to 13. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things of, that have now been announced to you through those who preached the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So the prophets, they were mainly used by God 
to give a warning to the people and to also talk about the coming of the, the anointed one, the Messiah. This is why if you, if you look at the prophets of old, they always had this thing. They always said, thus says the Lord, and then they would give the word. So they were God mouth, they, they were used by God. They were his mouthpiece to the people. So God used the prophet to give a message to the people. And that main message was the coming of the Messiah. So they prophesied about it. Isaiah prophesied in 50, Isaiah 53 about the sufferings of Christ. All these prophets, every single one of them was a prototype of Jesus Christ. They gave an incomplete message. It was fragmented. It was fragmented. It wasn't complete. So they gave just a picture. They gave bits and pieces. So they were used by God for that very purpose. Now, what do we read in verse 2? Let's listen to what this, the, the author says in verse 2. But in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Now, there's a difference there, and the, the, uh, the, um, the author is making that known. Listen, he's, made, he's creating a pattern here. He's trying to show a transition in the role and the importance of the prophet against Jesus himself. See, the prophet... They were God's messengers in the Old Testament. But when Jesus appeared in history, excuse me, when Jesus appeared in history, when the word became flesh and made his dwelling among the people, God revealed himself fully. He gave us himself through Jesus Christ, his son. Now God, in these last days, spoke through his son. So there's a difference there again. First, he was the prophet. He used the prophet as his, mouth, as his mouthpiece. But now, in these last days, the days that we are living in, from the days Jesus left to these days now, God spoke through his son. When Jesus appeared in history, when, he was, when the word became flesh, God now spoke through his son. This term son, in this phrase, the term son means that Jesus, unlike the prophet, isn't just a mere messenger, a mere man. No, Jesus wasn't just moved by the Spirit of God. Son means that Jesus is of the same essence, the same substance as God the Father. Okay, The prophets were not of the same substance as God the Father, but Jesus the Son, he is. So God revealed himself by the coming of his Son into the world. So, so, so when Jesus spoke the very words of God, he wasn't just going to say, thus says the Lord, because when Jesus spoke, he spoke as God himself, because he is God in essence. He is God in substance. He is the same as the Father. So while the prophets were important, while their ministry was very important, they were moved by the Spirit. But God, through Jesus, spoke. Okay? Jesus wasn't just a mere man. He was the Son of God because he was of the same essence as the Father. So when Jesus spoke, he spoke as a man uh, given the authority by God, in the sense that his authority wasn't just like the prophet's authority. I want to make sure that that point is so clear, because when Jesus spoke, he spoke as God himself. So it wasn't like, thus says the Lord. Now, when Jesus spoke, his, this is, these are my words, okay? You will often hear him say when he compares, um, when he talked about, you've heard he was said, do this, but I say to you, I say to you, because Jesus is the originator of all things. So he spoke the words, his very words, because those words were actually his to speak, because he is God incarnate, okay? Unlike the, the prophets, okay? Jesus didn't have to say, thus says the Lord, because he is God. Now, Jesus, according to this scripture, again, he's the heir of all things, the firstborn over all creation. He has preeminence over all things, because all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Okay? If you go to Colossians 1, verse 15 to 19, we read on the following. Let's go to Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, because for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he, may, he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was, dwelled to please, was pleased to dwell. And if you go to John 1, verse 1 to 3, we read the following. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. 
all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made now you can see jesus unlike the prophets isn't just a mere man okay see the prophets they were used as man and and god moved them through his spirit jesus is god incarnate god in the flesh so when the word became flesh god came and dwelled with us so at jesus baptism what do we learn god confirmed the status of jesus okay he what did he say this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased and, and the holy spirit descends on jesus like a dove to confirm his identity and the voice of god is heard i just told you about it so john bore witness to that so jesus as a result of his sonship, as a result of who he is, has been appointed the heir of all things before, because he is before all things. As we read in Colossians 1, verse 15 to 19, he created all things, so therefore he has preeminence. He, has, he, he is the firstborn over all creation in the sense that all things exist because of him. So therefore he has preeminence. He has the reward of the firstborn because he is the author of all things. God made all things through the word, the word of God. He is the word of God. The word became flesh. Let's go to Matthew 3, verse 13 to 17. Let's read about how Jesus, what, what the scripture tells us about Jesus. Matthew 3, let's read that. We're going to read here, 13 to 17. Listen to the scripture. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You see, Okay, he's showing us again the identity of Jesus. And we are going to also look at John 1, verse 29 to 34. We're going to see what John says about Jesus. 29 to 34. Listen to the scripture. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. This is John. And said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me because he, is, he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for, this, for, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and he remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I've seen and I've borne witness that this is the Son of God. Again, when the Jewish people say the Son of God, they are basically saying he is co-equal with the Father. He's of the same substance of the, with the Father. He is co-consubstantial. He's of the same essence, of the same stuff. So Jesus is God. God, very God, very God. Okay? So that's what the scripture says. When the scripture says he's the Son of God, that's basically making Jesus equal with the Father. This is what we learn in verse 2. And then verse 3, we learn the following. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So let's understand what's going on here. Again, scripture says that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. Okay? And creation indeed declares the majesty and the eternal power and divine nature of God. But that's all creation can do. Okay, that's all creation can do. Jesus, on the other hand, is the radiance of the glory of God, the brightness of his glory. Jesus doesn't just declare the glory of God. He is the glory of God concealed in the human flesh, in the human body. See, God, he tabernacled among men in Jesus. That's what God did. He tabernacled. He came and dwelled with men in Jesus, through Jesus. So in the Old Testament, when the cloud stood above the tabernacle, 
the glory of the, of the Lord filled the place. Okay, the she God Shekinah, the Shekinah glory he filled the place, and Moses could not even enter because of the brightness, because of the glory. Okay, but in Jesus, the fullness of God dwelled in a bodily form, concealed so that man could approach Jesus, man could approach God. Okay, now number two, Jesus is the expressed image of God in a bodily form, the exact imprint of His nature. So we read that in John 12, 45. Let's, let's go to John 12, 45 and read the following. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. This is what Jesus says about himself. And in John 14, 9, he says the same thing. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? He is the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus himself says it and agrees to it. Okay, he never denies it. So none of the prophets could ever make such a bold statement because they were all flawed. Okay, all the prophets had their own flaws, so they could never say, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. But Jesus can say that because he is the Son of God, meaning he is of the same substance as God. He is co-equal with God. It's because no other human face on, on the face of the earth can say that, except Jesus, because he is God incarnate. So this is what set him apart from the prophet. Okay, he's so so much different because Jesus is holy. He's set apart from anybody else that existed in, in, in history. Okay? And in him all things exist. Because he upholds, he upholds and sustains all things by his powerful word. He is the word of God. <laughs> he can make something from nothing. Jesus is the word of God. That's his name, the word of God. So he can make something from nothing. Okay, no prophets of old had any of these qualifiers. They, don't have, they didn't have, none of them had any of these qualifiers because Jesus' birth and three years' ministry proved all of this. He was born of a virgin, okay, and no other human in history was born of a virgin. His supernatural work, he walked on water. He defied the laws of nature. His healing ministry, he healed the sick, he raised the dead. His word breathed life into people, okay, and after his suffering and resurrection, which was proved by the way, he sat down at the highest place of honor, the right hand of God, the Father, the place only reserved for a person co-equal with God himself. So he became the propitiation and expiation for our sins, and no prophet ever did that. They died after their ministry was ended, and that was it. But Jesus' blood has so much worth that it was sufficient to atone for the sins of the entire world. You see, like, when you see Jesus, Jesus' superiority to the prophet is just it's not even com comparable. And the author of Hebrews is giving us a picture of that in just these three verses. Okay, we learn from this that, number one, God spoke in the, big, uh, in the old days through the prophet, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, meaning the person through whom he created all things. Okay? And this man, Jesus, upholds the universe by his powerful word because Jesus is the only one that can make something from nothing. He spoke things into existence and he, defies the, he defied the laws of nature. Okay, he is God incarnate. And this is what we learn from just these three verses. It's just incredible. Okay, and I don't know what else to say about these three verses. Maybe I've missed some things, but you get the point. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. And we know why Jesus has preeminence, because all things were made by him. So therefore, because all things were made by him, he has preeminence over everything. And he is the radiance of the glory of God. I read a commentary, and the commentary says that Jesus is to the Father what the rays uh, of the sun are to the sun. And you cannot separate that because the rays of the sun are, are of the same essence as the sun. In the same way, Jesus is of the same essence as God the Father. So you can't separate them. You can make the distinction, but you cannot separate them. So I don't know if this is a great analogy, but this is what I read in the commentary, which I think is important because Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. Okay, the radiance, light sent by light of the world. And Jesus, in Jesus, the, the, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. So he's not just like any other man. Okay, he stands, uh, he stands holy among all other men. We were all born with that sinful nature. We were all flawed. Jesus is perfect, the perfect human being. Okay, God, he is God incarnate. He has a dual nature. We say that he is God incarnate. So he has the, the divine nature and also the human nature. He was truly man, but also truly God. Because of all the, the submission of the attributes of God were present in Jesus. 
okay, the glory of God, the submission of all the attributes of God were present in Jesus. And when he walked on earth, he displayed every single one of them with the things that he did, with the words that he spoke, and with how he lived his life. And when he rose from the dead, he again proved to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. This is just incredible. So Jesus compared to the prophet. Jesus is way high up here, and the prophets are way down here. So the author is making sure that we understand that Jesus has supremacy over the prophets. And then next thing, he's going to also talk about the angels. Because prophets, the prophets were, were very respected by, by the Jewish people. Okay, Moses was highly esteemed. And Abraham was highly esteemed. Isaiah the prophet was highly esteemed. Jeremiah the prophet. Elijah. All these prophets were highly esteemed. But as highly esteemed as they were, they don't compare to Jesus. Because they served Jesus. Because he is God. Okay, they spoke on behalf of Jesus in the old days. But in these last days, God spoke to us directly by Jesus. This is why his name is Emmanuel. God with us. If you go to Isaiah 7.14, the scripture talks about that. So Jesus speaks as God. He doesn't speak as a man sent by God. Yes, he was sent by God, but he is God himself. All right? So that's what we learn from just these three verses. And then next week, we're, we're going to continue with the rest of this uh, chapter one of Hebrews. It's a great book, like I said, and we're going to learn a lot here. All right? Thank you, and have a wonderful day.